Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back. Hope that you've had a lovely week and that you're feeling very optimistic about how well the uh, semester is going and that your exams are going well. The exam in here, as a reminder, is on March 12th. That is um, next Friday, a week from today. I'm gonna to be putting out a review guide later today. And that review guide will cover the midterm exam. As a reminder, the midterm is gonna be multiple choice and true false combined with short answer. And all of the material from the first half of the course is fair game. So that includes readings, concepts, perspectives, video, all the content that we covered. Now, if you completed the readings and you've been keeping up with the class, and especially if you attend lecture, you'll be in a good position to do well. But if you're an individual who needs to review the reading or complete that in preparation for the exam, make sure that you give yourself plenty of space to do that because the exam is a place where you demonstrate knowledge of the reading and that's the best way to do well on the midterm. I'll have more to say about that next week and you can look for that study guide to come out later. As for where we are in here, remember that we are discussing crisis economics and in particular we're focusing on import substitution industrialization as one development strategy that developing countries take in pursuit of industrialization. We've talked about the different policies, the components that go into the ISI model, and we've begun to talk about how the, mo the model fell apart, what some of the weaknesses and limitations were, why the Latin American economies began to show signs of deteriorating in the 60s and the 70s, and especially the 80s. So far, we've talked about the role of budget deficits. And remember that I talked about how state ownership of enterprises, cheap credit, tax breaks, subsidies and transfers, all of this contributed to enormous government spending. And you know, to be clear, in any economy, the government is ordinary, the single biggest consumer, including the United States economy. The government will always be one of the biggest economic actors just because of its sheer consumption and how much spending actually comes from the government. But when there's so much spending that countries begin to run budget deficits where they're borrowing a great deal of money and they're borrowing a large proportion of their actual GDP, well, that's when they become well, that's when they're really in trouble. And a good example is the country of Argentina. This was one of the biggest economies during the ISI period. I told you already about how in the 19 teens, Argentina was one of the richest countries in the world. Take a look at budget deficits compared to inflation rates during the period from 1960 to 2010. At the beginning of the period, deficits were relatively low. Deficits as a proportion or as the percentage of GDP were about two or 3%. That's pretty high, but that's not unreasonably high. The United States, other large countries run deficits of that order, generally speaking. But as the years go on, and especially as the 70s come into vogue, those deficits begin to explode. As a percentage of GDP, by about 1974 or 75, the deficit is about 11 or 12%. And it falls a little bit in the early 80s, but by the mid 1980s, it's reaching up there again. And as a result of a lot of this spending, and although the relationship is complex, the inflation rate began to rise. That is, what began to happen was there was an overall increase in the price structure. By the 1990s, generations of government spending, deficits, high volumes of debt, 
from borrowing, from Western banks, inflation rates began to creep up. And by the 1990s, Argentina had a real problem. Very, very high inflation rates, hyperinflation rates, and large deficits. And this is the pattern that duplicated itself throughout Latin America. High deficits as a percentage of GDP, and then eventually very high inflation rates as a result of high spending by the government. Now these budget deficits went hand in hand with trade deficits because remember that these countries in order to industrialize had to import machinery, capital goods, raw materials, anything that couldn't be produced domestically had to be obtained abroad. And so ironically, a model that was supposed to be characterized by domestic production and protectionism resulted in large trade deficits in more imports than ever before because of the, the huge volume of capital needed to jumpstart the industrialization process. But remember that at the same time that these countries are importing machinery and capital goods, they're also imposing very, very high tariffs on exports in export-oriented sectors, and they're imposing very high tariffs on most imports. And so even as they're importing machinery and capital goods, they're basically suppressing exports in comparatively advantaged sectors, like in Argentina, for example, agricultural sectors like cattle and beef and grain. These were sectors that had a comparative advantage because of Argentina's ability to produce in those sectors very efficiently as a result of geography and a, and a number of factors that made them very good at exporting beef and cattle and grain. But those agricultural marketing boards suppressed exports of agricultural products. And so exports declined in precisely those areas where countries were really, really good at exporting, even as they're importing more than ever before. And so countries wound up with very large trade deficits. They're importing more than they're exporting because they're suppressing exports and they're, they're relying on imports of machinery and capital goods. So we've got budget deficits and trade deficits. If you take a look at the example of Argentina again, you can see these trade deficits. And one way of looking at them is examining the overall trade balance, which is basically just the difference between uh, exports and imports. And these negative numbers indicate a trade deficit. Positive numbers indicate a trade surplus. When there's a trade surplus, it means the country is exporting more than it's importing. When there's a trade deficit, it means that the country is importing more than it's exporting. And even though tariffs limited a lot of exchange with the international economy, you can still see that generally speaking, Argentina ran trade deficits because of the need to import a lot of machinery and capital goods that could not be produced domestically. And these trade imbalances were, were very, very bad for the economy for obvious reasons because it made, made them less competitive and it, it meant that there was less income and that was, there was more spending. Um, a third issue, and one that is discussed far less often, relates to rent seeking and corruption. Rent seeking occurs when a firm or an actor uses politics to obtain higher than, than market return on investment. Basically, this is the idea that actors take advantage of political mechanisms or relationships with politicians to give themselves advantages or privileges that they could not otherwise obtain through the market. 
if we assume that the market always produces some return on investment or activity, we can also imagine then abusing the political system or abusing political relationships or using power to obtain higher returns than, than we would get ordinarily just based on our economic activity. So abusing political connections or using inside information. One of the most common forms of rent seeking under ISI related to rights to import restricted luxury goods. In particular, remember how I told you that because tariffs were so high, it became virtually impossible to obtain things like cars or other consumer goods that were produced in mainly Western countries and that previously were imported relatively easily before the Great Depression. It became very difficult to get these things because tariffs were so high. One way of getting them though, was obtaining exclusive rights to import them. So basically obtaining licensing, licenses. Even though these tariffs were very, very high, every year there were always some licenses, some licenses, excuse me, that could be obtained to import them. And so the rights to import these things, these licenses were very, very val valuable. And naturally, as you could imagine, it was abused, the system was abused. It became very easy for people with connections or in high places to abuse or take advantage of those connections to get the, the rights to import restricted luxury items. And so you can imagine, for instance, fancy cars um, or other fancy consumer goods that previously were easily obtained and imported, but after the Great Depression and with the onset of ISI became extremely difficult to get because of the tariffs and how expensive they suddenly became. Again, the reason was because those items were produced domestically. And if it was produced domestically, the goal was to promote consumption of those domestically produced items and making imported goods much, much more expensive with tariffs was one way to do it. But obviously, rent seeking in the form of obtaining rights to import restricted luxury items defeats the purpose and sort of evades the spirit of, of those tariffs. So you generate perverse incentives in effect. The system was so inward looking that it became quite valuable for particular groups or individuals or actors to bribe government officials for exclusive licenses to import these products. So if you really, really wanted a fancy car you often needed to have someone in a high place or a connection that you could use to, to obtain a license to import that item. Now, one of the most important questions is how did ISI impact development? So far, I've been talking about budget deficits and trade deficits and some of these economic indicators that seem obviously relevant, and you can imagine that budget deficits and trade deficits would impact development and indicators like the human development index coefficient or the distribution of income or income per person or the growth of the economy. But let's take a look at actual data regarding the standard of living and the direction of change in the standard of living over the course of several decades. And then we'll also look at the distribution of income by using the Gini coefficient to look at the distribution of income over time. And you can then think about different periods or decades, 1950s and 1960s, 1970s and 1980s. For our purposes, the ISI period, roughly speaking, is basically between 1950 and 1980, more or less. Some of the reforms that we'll discuss next week started in the 70s, but this period right here, these three columns, 
basically relate or, or correspond to the ISI period. In up until about 1977 in this data set. We've got Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Mexico, Peru, and Venezuela. Those are the biggest Latin American economies. So it makes sense to look at them. This data is coming from a recent article in the Brazilian Journal of Political Economy. It's useful for us just to take a look at this and get a sense of how ISI might have impacted these important indicators. And so how did it impact those indicators? Well, what you notice is that looking at standard of living, from 1950 to 1970, most countries saw a decline in the standard of living with the exception of Argentina, which saw an increase. You take a look at the period from 1960 to 1980, and you notice that, again, most countries register a decline in the standard of living. This time, the exception is Brazil. Overall, the trend appears to show a decline in the standard of living in these countries. Take a look at the Gini coefficient and you look at the change over time. And you notice that in most cases, the Gini coefficient reveals an increase over time. The only exception, oh, there really are no exceptions. So generally speaking, ISI did not correspond with a significant improvement in the standard of living, and it did not correspond with a significant reduction in income inequality. Instead, we didn't see a significant change in those indicators. In fact, we saw a decline in standards of living, but there are some important exceptions. You saw, for instance, that Argentina saw an improvement. You saw that Brazil saw an improvement as well. There may be real questions about the viability of ISI as a development strategy based on this data. And we might ask, for instance, if ISI was too expensive a strategy and wasn't capable of generating a return. We'll assess this data again next week when we compare it to the neoliberal policies that, that followed the ISI policies. Matt says, aren't those relative? So going from an increase of 16% to an increase, increase of 9% isn't getting worse, but getting better slower. Yeah, I think it might actually be relative um, now that you mention it. but I'm gonna to return to that data um, and have more to say about that. Let's talk about the beginning of the end of ISI and in particular, the period of the 1980s. Um, so ISI generated these large budget and trade deficits and in doing so forced governments to borrow more and more. And in particular, 
they had to get this money from somewhere. So they began to borrow heavily from Western banks. And as they borrowed from Western banks, they accumulated larger and larger debt loads. And this eventually culminated in what we call the Latin American debt crisis. And the Latin American debt crisis is really sort of the end of the road for ISI because it did signal the decline of the model and the collapse of, of, of the model and because it relied so much on, on government spending that was fed by, by debt. And so by 1983, 27 countries were trying to restructure their debt. And these included Mexico, Brazil, Venezuela, and Argentina. And so all of the biggest players, all of the biggest economies were saddled with debt loads that were unsustainable and that were a reflection of these budget and trade deficits. Now, what is a debt crisis? A debt crisis is a situation where a government defaults on its debt, where it fails to make a payment on its debt load. And this failure to pay, this default, it scares foreign lenders and they refuse to offer new loans. Now, the default itself is scary, but the threat of default is also scary. And in Latin America in the 1980s, the countries were carrying so much debt and were so unable to repay them that even countries that didn't outright default began to face higher and higher interest rates and it became harder and harder for them to finance continued consumption and, and development. And so the ISI model began to run aground for two reasons. It, it was difficult to continue to support indebted firms, but it was also difficult to continue to obtain new loans. And the threat of default was as scary as default itself. And this general period resulted in extraordinary reductions in, in income and very, very high interest rates. And this made government and private sector debts much harder to repay. Remember that this wasn't just a, a public debt crisis. Governments did hold a lot of the debt because they were financing state enterprises and subsidizing industries, but individuals and households also held a lot of debt. And private sector debts, as well as government debts, became harder to repay during this period. And the debt crisis was was a direct result of ISI. And so the 1980s corresponded to the, to the debt crisis. And the 1980s began a period that was really referred to as a lost decade because of the declines in income and the high interest rates and the, the, the economic collapse that essentially ensued in most of these countries. Yes, Lewis. So Argentina, Argentina did take the biggest hit. Argentina was really developed in the mid 19 teens. And remember that in particular, the agricultural products that they exported generated a lot of income for the country. And so while they did accomplish industrialization and they invested a large proportion of national income in industries increasingly from the 1930s, the country as a whole suffered greatly because they basically sacrificed many of their comparative advantages in agriculture through the use of those agricultural marketing boards. And those declines in development were quite sharp. Argentina is just one example though, and I would suggest that we also think about the example of, of Venezuela and examples like Chile as well. Chile is considered a, an example of, of the success of economic liberal policies, but much of the growth in Chile took place prior to, to the neoliberal policies. And even the neoliberal policies, much of their success um, depended on a, a variety of different policies. We'll talk a lot about 
how different countries experience this differently. So one way of looking at the debt crisis and the growth in the debt held by Latin American countries is to just look at their outstanding debt, that is foreign debt and in billions. And at the beginning of the 1970s, they were still relatively in the clear, but by 1986 and 87, the debt crisis had reached its peak and Latin American countries had almost 500 billion in, in foreign debt. And the reason that you begin to see it, see it trail off here isn't because the situation began to improve, isn't because Latin American countries began to pull out of the crisis necessarily. It really has more to do with the fact that foreign lenders stopped offering them new loans because of how high the debt load was, not because uh, it, the situation didn't change because the situation improved. It was because they, they, they couldn't get loans as easily. And if they could get loans, it required very high interest rates and substantial domestic adjustment and in the form of austerity and conditionality. And this is what you see here, represented here. By the mid 1980s, the loans from the largest US banks to Latin American countries or less developed countries, a large proportion of which are Latin American countries at this time, begin to trail off. It's because those banks begin to sort of pump the brakes and they begin to stop offering loans to those countries. You might be wondering, well, why were they offering those loans in the first place? What was going on to you know, lead them to provide that 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 much money and well the answer is that business was booming and these economies were growing they were growing rapidly and they were driven by domestic consumption so even though private and and, and other financiers who offered up these loans these big these big banks uh, even though they knew that this ISI model was inward looking and didn't, for example, take advantage of, of some of those comparative advantages, remember that those growth rates in the 60s and the 70s were still quite robust. And so countries like Mexico and Argentina were viewed as a safe bet because those economies were still growing. But anyone who believes that infinite growth can go on forever is either a madman or an economist. And it's not me who made that up. It's, uh, I think, an economist who, who said that. But often, when things are, are good, it's easy to lose sight of, of reality and forget that, that reality has a way of, of smacking you in the face. And I think that in the heyday of ISI, that was what was going on. Business was booming and, you know, channeling these loans to these Latin American countries was viewed as relatively safe because they were still, they were still growing despite their increasing need for, for, for foreign credit. Well, increasing debt doesn't stop economic growth. To be clear, the United States is still able to borrow heavily because it's still viewed as a credible debtor, right? No one, no one thinks the US won't pay its debts off. As long as the United States is, is re retaining a, a, a relatively good or a good credit rating, um, what is it, still AAA? It was, mar it was, struck, it was um, put down to, to AA plus at one point. But the point is that it has all everything to do with the credibility of the debtor and how that debtor is viewed on the international market. So the United States will always, is, is going to be viewed as capable of always paying back its debts. And so it won't face the high interest rates that Argentina or Mexico faced. Argentina or Mexico, on the other hand, because they had more and more debt, even though they were growing, they did face higher and higher interest rates when it became clear that there was some threat of a, def of a default. So it's not that debt is bad for growth by itself, it's that high interest rates are bad for growth. 
So, you know, when, when you can't finance your debt driven consumption and growth, that's when it's a problem. But when you can finance it with more debt, because you can, you can pay that debt off some way or another, or you can, or you're viewed as capable or credible, it's easier. And we should be clear that the United States is, is exceptional also because it's, it's, it's the creator of what we call the reserve currency. The reserve currency is still the United States dollar. And that reserve currency is, is the currency that is used to resolve uh, all debts, right? Or the currency that's viewed as the sort of ultimate currency in the international system. And so as long as the US has that role, in addition to the fact that it is viewed as capable of paying off its debts, it's in a, a strong position politically to uh, continue this, this approach. So as Adolfo says, yeah, I remember some economists around 2012 say that the US shows its power through debt. Basically, yeah. And you know what's interesting is to note that during the financial crisis, China considered selling a lot of its US debt bonds and inflicting a lot of harm on the United States, but they chose not to do that. But the question of debt does have a lot to do with power. And it, it's important to remember that interest rates have a lot to do with how, fi how viable it is to finance development with debt. Let's watch a video that talks about the example of Mexico. I told them a very old Mexican expression. We owe you money, I recognize it, but I don't have any money to pay you back. It was the detonation of the debt crisis. As finance minister in 1982, Jesus Silva Herzog Flores broke the news to the world that Mexico would hold repayment of its debt, triggering a continent-wide crisis. He spent four years in the eye of the storm and sees strong parallels with Europe. We expand the public sector, and as it happens when you are in a booming period, you forget the fundamentals. And that's what we have been seeing in Europe today. When the US Federal Reserve raised interest rates, Mexico's spiraling debt could no longer be serviced. Washington and the IMF moved to help with conditions. Under pressure, Herzog imposed austerity measures, including slashing the public sector. By 1989, per capita GDP had shrunk by 11%. It was the so-called lost decade. Probably it is true. We lost uh, a decade, but to a certain extent, we won a decade. Because during that period, we opened up the economy. Uh, we privatized a good number of public companies. You don't think those, those austerity measures that were wanted by the IMF that you imposed, you don't think they bit too hard on the Mexican economy? The problem here is how to manage the sacrifice, the shrinking of the economy, the decrease in the minimum wage, in the welfare of the people, with opportunities of employment and of growth. And you look at Greece, do you think the measures there are too severe, the austerity measures? I think they are too severe, especially because they have had already five, six, seven years of negative growth. A big difference in Mexico was that the previous period, we had a boom. So we have a kind of a fat that uh, we can use in the austerity period. After the default, private lenders from Japan to the United States were facing bankruptcy. An agreement needed to be reached. Here, Herzog signs a deal to delay payment of more than $8 billion. But like in Greece, most IMF loans ended up in the hands of creditors. What lessons do you think specifically can be applied to the crisis in Europe right now? That the problems are not going to be solved from one day to the other. We lived through a difficult decade in the 80s. And I don't see how Europe will escape from something like a lost decade. Second, there is a need of a political will on the part of the debtor and on the part of the creditor. The debtor is going to see a deterioration in the standard of living of its population with social unrest, 
and the creditor will lose money. No other way. See, that there you have it. Talks about the expansion of the public sector, talks about the role of debt in financing that expansion, talks about how the boom period that preceded the debt crisis meant that Mexico sort of had a layer of fat, so to speak, that could be useful during the period of austerity that followed. And all the while, the comparison that is made to Greece in 2012 is quite instructive because that's a debt crisis as well. In both cases, interest rates are high and there's a lot of public debt as well as private debt. The difference though, is that in Mexico as in Latin American cases more generally, there was substantial economic growth in a sustained boom period. That was the ISI period. And so what's interesting to note is that even though the ISI experiment came to an end and resulted in, in a debt crisis during its actual heyday, it did contribute to high sustained economic growth for multiple decades. Uh, and in the process, it did help to improve standards of living and human development outcomes, but it didn't do so in a way that was sustainable. It contributed to large budget deficits and trade deficits. And ultimately it put the economies in, in, in positions where austerity policies would be necessary to de-involve the economy, excuse me, de-involve the state in the economy in order to reduce spending, reduce those deficits and eventually return to equilibrium, so to speak. But that process would be extremely, extremely uncomfortable and difficult to manage politically and economically and socially in the process of, of transition that it's inherent in reform is, is always political and economic and drawn out. It's not linear, it's, it's characterized by fits and starts. Before we discuss that process of reform and neoliberal economics in the eventual crisis of, of neoliberal economics, I wanna discuss ISI and development more. And I think that we can go back to uh, this. And I'd like to focus on improvements in, in the standard of living. And these, again, show the percent change in the, the UN Human Development Index coefficient. And so take Argentina, for example. In 1950 to 1960, the period shows an 8% improvement in the standard of living compared to the previous period. During the period from 1960 to 1970, it shows a 16% improvement over the previous period. But by 1970, it shows only a 9% improvement. And by 1980, it's beginning to show not just a small improvement, but no improvement at all. And the standard of living is, is, is outright in decline. And what you'll notice is that the period between 1980 and 1990 was characterized by these declines in every single country in this data set including Mexico. Now this period was called a lost decade because of the high interest rates, because of the crippling of the economy and the contraction that resulted from less public spending, the withdrawal of the state from the economy. This is a period that's very, very difficult to live through for anyone. And it's a period that takes a toll in Mexico, in Peru, in Venezuela, in Argentina, in Brazil. Now, we also notice that even despite 
ISI policies, economic inequality essentially begins to increase and more and more as the years go on. And you'll notice, for instance, that in Argentina, it was a relatively low Gini coefficient in the early 1950s, 0.37. But by 1985, it's 0.51. How could it be that ISI policies wind up contributing to an increase in economic inequality? How can we understand that? Wasn't the goal of ISI to reduce inequality and improve standards of living? Why is it that standards of living decline under ISI in the, in the late years? What, what is it that might explain these patterns? What, what ideas do you have? Okay, I wanna say, I think these two tables are really cool because they tell a very big story about the state of South America over the second half of the 20th century. And what you can see is they played catch up to the more developed parts of the world pretty well. Uh, but they didn't do it in a way that the Western world liked it because they did it separately. They had state control over uh, many industries. So then the, they're bankrupted by, these, by their creditors or they bankrupted themselves because the creditors didn't agree with the, the path they were on. And um, it just led to terrible outcomes. And the overall arching thing is they, they never, you see by the Gini coefficient, these highly unequal countries stayed unequal the entire time. So even as they were relatively getting better, uh, they were still abhorred, like just corrupt. And uh, not like, not like a society that not, not, they aren't putting out inequality numbers you want to see from like a fair society. So it just, it, this, these two tables tell a big story about South America. So there's a lot here in Matt's comment. And, you know, I don't want to be a broken record here and say too much about Argentina. We say a lot about Argentina, but Argentina is really one of the best examples of what happened. They played catch up as Matt points out in a sense. And maybe in Argentina, they didn't so much play catch up as just sort of kind of ride the gains for a few decades before eventually sort of petering out, so to speak. Remember what happened in 1980? In the 1980s in Argentina, they, they began to invest smaller and smaller proportions of national income and in industry and by the 1980s, they were investing almost nothing at all. And not only that, they were essentially undertaking a process of, of deindustrialization where they were transferring resources from industry to other sectors. And in addition, in Argentina, there was a lot of corruption and a lot of rent seeking, in particular by the wealthiest families and the wealthiest holding companies in the country. These families, they're called the, the Patria Concertistas, and they formed what were essentially this network. They were aligned with the military regime, and during the period from 1976 to 1983, they really, really got rich. They were able to cash in on a variety of schemes that contributed to gaining monopoly power and larger shares of the market and new tax breaks, new deals with state firms, 
all sorts of sweet hookups that they got precisely because of their political power. And so what you have is you've got a model, an ISI model that is investing money, income in industry and is helping to spur the creation of middle classes. But you've also got corruption and rent seeking layered on top of that and cronyism that comes from the political relationships that exist between the elites inside the system. And, and it, also the system is built off, this is like, this is a racial system in South America at the time. The rich people are all, most not all, but mostly the white people or the people that look closest to uh, the colonizers. And, uh, and the, and the, Poor people that are being lifted out of poverty are usually native, indigenous, mixed. Those are the the, the unwealth, the not wealthy people. Yeah, exactly. And the mestizos are the mixed ones, the 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 ones who are a mix of indigenous and European. And the whites are disproportionately represented among the ranks of the of the richest in those elites, those elite families and companies. And what happened in Argentina, that, that cronyism, that corruption, that rent seeking also happened in Brazil. And it also happened in Chile. It also happened in Mexico. And so what's interesting is that we already know that in Latin America, the period of colonialism left behind extractive institutions and helped to concentrate power in the hands of a rich few. And as a result, these countries were sent down paths where money and power were concentrated in the hands of a few. And the societies developed in a way that it did not redistribute power and money and, and resources among the ordinary people in society. So when these societies adopted ISI, they still had those hierarchical forms of social organization. They still had those powerful elites. They still had those economic groups that took advantage of the economy. They still had those power brokers who sat atop the system and, and played it as if they were puppeteers, so to speak. And in a country like Argentina, you had in particular a set of elites in a set of rent seeking relationships that that coincided with the ISI model. And so these countries never really were able to dispense with those original extractive institutions. And as a result, the ISI model was not able to produce an outcome uh, that was satisfactory. And to be clear, it doesn't mean that the policies of ISI uh, gets, get off scot-free. We're not exonerating those policies, but we're suggesting that politics played an important role as well. And that the actors and the distributions of political power and the relationships that existed in those countries before ISI was ever adopted had a lot to do with the way that ISI was implemented. And so this is an interesting lesson in how extractive institutions are difficult to ever really do away with. We might ask genuine questions about whether ISI was implemented in a viable and effective way in countries like Argentina and Brazil. And also, it's important to think about whether politics or policy is more to blame more generally. And this is a question that I'll leave you with as we begin to wrap things up. Whenever we evaluate the rise and fall of a system, we have to ask ourselves, is it the result of bad policy or bad politics? In other words, is the system itself fraught and sown with the seeds of its own destruction or are the players, the actors, are they the ones who sent the, uh, the system overboard and led to the collapse of the system? Was it the way they behaved and the way they played 
that led to the to the fallout. In the end, it's a question that I think is unresolved. And still today, ISI is debated. This article that I drew this data from, for example, argues about whether or not ISI or neoliberalism did more to contribute to the eventual development of, of Latin American countries. Next week, when we deal with neoliberalism, we'll address that question more directly and we'll begin to compare and, and assess the two models for their, their merits and their drawbacks. But this was, a, I think, a very useful discussion today. As always, we learn a lot and we get to the bottom of it. I'm going to be putting together that review guide and sending that out. Um, although I will probably just post it on CAD courses tonight. We'll talk about that next week. Have a lovely weekend, everybody, and uh, I'll see you on Monday.